All right, as promised, now we're gonna talk about seismic bases. One of my favorite lectures. Okay, so seismic facies, we wanna start with kind of understanding why they matter. And I know I just talked about it in my last lecture, um, but they, uh, when we think about seismic facies and seismic stratigraphy, they allow us to interpret our seismic horizons within a framework, a ge geologic framework. And so these horizons alone don't tell us everything, but um, what we can do with more than the horizons is think about these uh, genetically related sediments based on, on their packages, their seismic facies. Um, and as we become more comfortable with these terms, they really help us understand um, how we can start to make predictions about the rock types, um, about the depositional environments that we're seeing in the seismic data. Um, and, you know, like also when we're doing these, we wanna keep in mind resolution and frequency and all of those topics that I talked about in the, the first module. So let's get going. So with seismic facies, what we want to first focus on is the reflection parameters. And so um, in the Hart textbook, he talks about four main seismic facies that, parameters that we want to think about. And so this is what are we going to notice every time we look at the seismic. And those are the reflection configurations. So those are kind of the geometric patterns that we're seeing in the seismic, the reflection continuity, the reflection amplitude and the reflection frequency. Okay, and so all four of those seismic facies parameters we can use in our descriptions. And like I mentioned before, this is kind of like um, the results section. So we describe the seismic, we describe the seismic facies, and then later on we can interpret it. And what these seismic facies reflection features can give us information on are things like um, the bedding pattern, depositional processes, uh, fluid context in terms of the configuration. Um, in terms of amplitude, we can get information about impedance contrasts that are related to lithologic differences, fluid differences. Um, we can even get information about bed spacing. So if you go back and think about thin beds and the wedge model and how we get that constructive interference um, from the top and base. So that's how reflection helps us with bed spacing. Um, and then frequency, similar thing. Bed thickness, it can help us understand, and also fluid content. And so what we want to do is we want to kind of combine all of our observations together. And so here we've got some reflection uh, patterns. Um, in this case, we're looking, we could see some kind of clinoforms in this area. Boom. Um, and they've mapped out some areas of top lap, some areas of down lap with these green arrows. We've got on lap with the blue arrows. Um, and then even over here, we've got some erosional truncation. And so um, as we start interpreting these patterns, the seismic facies, the, the continuity, we also want to keep a lookout for these different features, which can be very revealing to us. Um, here we've got, down here in this bottom right hand side, we've got that erosional truncation marked in red. And then we can see that on lapping, you know, if this is a channel, um, I'm trying to read in my notes. Um, I think this is a channel in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And so we've got the erosion of a larger scale channel, and then we've got the, the filling of it up with sediments at a later time. But we want to keep in mind that even as we observe all of these seismic patterns, um, it can be it can be misinterpreted very, very easily. Um, so these are some examples um, in the Postman Tier paper, and I'll have a whole lecture on pitfalls towards the end of this course. Um, in this case, we've got a tilted gas water contact. Um, so you can see it kind of pointed out here. Typically, we would expect our gas water contact to be flat, but in this case, it's, it's tilted in this carbonate platform. Um, over here, we've got some interesting, um, we've got clinoforms, and then we see this interesting uh, pseudo unconformity that's actually due to diagenetic effects. So a change in the, the mineral structure. And then down here in the Australian Northwest Shelf, we've got some lovely reflectors that we can interpret, but in actuality, they're multiples. So they're these reverberations of the seismic energy um, kind of hitting the same reflector multiple times and kind of peg-legging uh, before it's recorded. 
So this is a, a great kind of example of reflection continuity and amplitude variability. Um, so what we've got here are some examples looking at continuity where we have very discontinuous and then continuous features kind of shown in seismic and then also with a diagram. Um, in terms of amplitude, we can have very low amplitude and very high amplitude. And then down here in terms of frequency, um, we could have lower, higher frequency and then also lower frequency. And uh, we could have very discontinuous patterns. So there's a lot, there's a lot that we could start to pick out and describe in terms of these different elements uh, for seismic interpretation. And so at this point, I always like to just remember, uh, remind you all that, that a lot of what we're doing when we're interpreting is we're recognizing patterns and we're tying those to, to geologic meaning. So the more seismic we look at, the better. Um, so typically in my class, I'll encourage all my students to pick out a, a feature, a geologic feature that interests them, and then go and find several examples of how that feature looks in seismic. So if you need a little homework, that's, that's your homework. Okay. So going back to the reflection features that I mentioned, continuity, uh, configuration, amplitude, and frequency, um, we can break those down um, in terms of, of additional terminology. And so I've noticed uh, looking through textbooks and reading a lot of papers that have been published that folks will use uh, slightly different terminology. Um, so it's not overly standardized. Um, but typically we'll talk about high amplitudes and low amplitudes. Uh, you can have moderate amplitudes and then variable amplitudes. And of course, all of this is relative to other features in the seismic. In terms of continuity or geometries, we'll talk about continuous, discontinuous, uh, disrupted, contorted, hummocky, wavy, lenticular. And then reflection configuration patterns can be parallel. You could have sub-parallel. So um, divergent, you could have clinoforms. So clinoforms is one of the one terms that we use to describe the seismic, but then it also, you know, kind of has a lot more geologic meaning already built into it. Um, chaotic and then reflection free. And so I'm going to kind of go through these in a, in a minute, but I want to show you this great example. Um, and I showed one a, a few lectures ago. I think in the intro lecture, but I, I love these examples in terms of communicating what you're seeing as an interpreter. And so in this case, uh, from this paper, and I tried not to just take all my students' papers, so this is not one of them. Um, what they show here is the seismic pattern. Um, in this case, they have an understanding of the seismic sequence and the age of it. And then they describe it first. So parallel to subparallel seismic reflection patterns, and then they interpret it probably interlayered conglomerate beds that produce brighter reflections. And so breaking these into two steps, I find, um, is, is very critical for communicating what you're seeing because, uh, you know, we won't go in and disagree that they're seeing parallel and subparallel seismic reflections. Um, so that's the data. That's the results, uh, you know, thinking about it in high school lab reports. And then the interpretation or the discussion is interlayered conglomerate beds that produce brighter reflections. So making, there's a lot of different ways to make tables and charts like these, but I find them very, very great, whether you're uh, putting together a paper, a master's thesis, um, or, you know, just trying to show what you're seeing in, in terms of a presentation, maybe, maybe to management to get approval for something. And so there's a lot of different ways to classify internal reflection patterns. So I'm going by kind of the classic AAPG way of, of doing it um, in terms of having different stratified reflection patterns and then unstratified. And so I'm going to walk through these. With our very simple stratified internal configurations, you can have your parallel where things are very even. Um, now we see the cartoons of the words I used a few slides ago. We've got subparallel, we've got divergent. Okay, so all of these um, you know, our, our nice, standard, simple configuration patterns. We also have progradational internal configuration patterns, and I'll show a couple of quick examples of these. Um, but so you've got some stratification. You can have your, your shingled patterns. You can have sigmoidal, and then you could have oblique. And the way I, I try to remember um, 
the the difference between these is the you know all of these are, are building out um, but with the the oblique ones we tend to be moving uh, less up and more out whereas the sigmoidal we tend to be building up and out at the same time and so that gives us information um, so here's an example um, from the Nanda seismic uh, data interpretation textbook um, showing some oblique and some sigmoidal. And so you can see the oblique we're building out in this direction, not up so much, but out. So oblique starts with an O, building out starts with an O. You know, I try to do these kind of little, little tricks to remember things. And then sigmoidal we're building, you know, up and out a little bit more. Um, okay, and then here's another case of, um, what do they call these? Oblique parallels. So they're they're kind of, um, you know, combining two terms, you know, kind of almost shingle patterned in, in my mind, but where, you know, they're very parallel, they're building outwards, not upwards. And then here's a case of what they call the shingles, um, interpretive shingles. And so you can see between these two major horizons, we've got that shingle patterned right here. Okay, so then we've got complex internal configurations. So these, there's a lot more than, than just these, um, but we can have mounding, we can have like this hummocky texture or a very deformed texture. Here we've got kind of like a, a mounded, you know, disrupted <laughs> uh, for the deformed. And so um, these tend to show more significant thickening and thinning um, more locally than, than we see in the, the more simple internal configurations. Um, these are some additional facies definitions that um, are in the, from the Hart textbook. So like I mentioned, we've got lots of words that we can use as descriptors. Um, here we've got parallel, continuous, and even. Um, and so he uses parallel, continuous, wavy. Um, down here, I'm jumping down to D, we've got parallel, wavy, but disrupted. Okay, so you can see how we're building these words together to describe it. Um, C is hummocky, so kind of like we saw in the, the last image. E, we've got those clinoforms. F is chaotic, so there's not really any discernible pattern. Uh, G would be reflection-free, and then H would be divergent. And so um, I'm going to pause here in a second for like 10 seconds, but I want you to, to quickly jot down or just think of how you would describe this seismic here. So let's say up in this area in terms of the amplitude, frequency, continuity, and configuration. Okay, so um, one of the, the things you'll notice about the amplitude is it's very low. Um, it's not variable, you know, maybe you could call it moderate, like down here it's a little bit lower, up here it's a little bit moderate, and we have the seafloor. This is um, in the Pegasus Basin of New Zealand. Um, so we have the seafloor to use an, as an example of what a high, uh, uh, a high amplitude would look like. So we've got maybe moderate, uh, parallel, continuous, I would call these. Um, down here it's a little bit more uh, still continuous, but low amplitude. Um, in terms of frequency, we don't have like great comparisons. We're, we're just seeing, you know, maybe a second or so of data. Um, it's all fairly high frequency relative to one another. Um, if we look in this area right here, things look a little bit more chaotic and um, low, low, low amplitude, uh, just right, right in there. Um, here's uh, some more cases where we have a much more chaotic pattern, still low amplitude um, on this left-hand side. And then I'll pause and I'll let you think about this right-hand side. Okay, pause over. Um, so obviously we've got high amplitudes. They look a little bit lower frequency um, than what's above it. Um, there's a lot of variability in the frequency, so that's a term that we, we don't always use, but we want to consider. Um, continuity, they're, they're not very continuous. They actually seem to have more of a, a mounded or hummocky structure. And so what this is, is this is actually, um, well, they haven't drilled wells there, um, but with the, 
kind of predominance of this kind of cross-cutting blue horizon right here. This is likely some gas that's been built up under a BSR, so they're being trapped by gas hydrates in this region. And so you've got some, some gas in this area, and that's what's providing that more high, high frequency amplitude, or high amplitude. <laughs> okay, so just to wrap up um, with, with some key concepts from this mini lecture, um, we've got different ways that we can describe our, our, our seismic. Um, and I tend to want to try to think about describing it with, with those four different um, kind of buckets from amplitude, frequency, continuity, and configuration. And so this is how we uh, kind of present the results, the observations that we're making as scientists. And then there's a lot of different words, different patterns that you can build up and start adding into your vocabulary as you're describing. Um, you can think about how these different patterns like mounded, um, you know, we can see a mounded feature in seismic data, but we can also think about what geologic uh, depositional settings will, will mound data, uh, mound sediments, um, you know, perhaps with uh, levees, overbank levees, um, will give us a mounded pattern. Um, so all of this kind of taking our observations um, really lets us know more about the lithology, perhaps reservoir quality. So we're taking these patterns, relating them to geology. Geology often gives us information about lithology um, and what we could expect using our, mod our, our modern analogs. And so I always like to remind folks that seismic interpretation, sometimes it feels as much as an, as much an art as it is a science. And we really want to take that um, you know, appreciate the art of it, um, but we also want to make sure that we're injecting as much science into it as possible. So reducing our interpretational bias, um, the ideas that we may have or may be preferential to in terms of depositional settings, um, so that we can kind of treat this as, as data as, as much as possible um, to get the best kind of geologic interpretations for, for the purpose that we're interpreting seismic. Uh, so with that, I'll stop and thank you for listening.